Well, hello, Emmanuel Baptist Church family. This is Pastor Sean, and uh, it is Wednesday, and I am going to be doing a midweek teaching today for us as a church family. And one of the things that I want to do during this COVID-19 pandemic is to bring hope to us, to bring encouragement to us, to, to let us be enriched by what the scripture says about who we are in Christ. And so that's why on Sunday mornings, I'm doing the Psalms, uh, Hope in the Psalms sermons to kind of give us hope. But in today's teaching, I want to talk about an issue that maybe a lot of Christians struggle with. And that is the issue of the assurance of salvation. How do you know that you're saved how are you secure in that salvation? Now, there's two ultimate questions that are very, very important to ask. Uh, the first question that's the most important question that anybody can ask is, how do I get saved? How do I have a relationship with Jesus? And the Bible's answer to that is, you must repent and believe in Jesus Christ alone as Lord and Savior. That's the most important question. How do you get into a relationship with, with Christ? It's through repentance and belief. But then the second question is, okay, if I have been saved, how do I know I've, I'm truly saved? Especially when I go through periods of doubt, when I go through periods of struggle, when I go through periods of sin. And so what I want to address in this teaching is the assurance of salvation. And so what, where I want to start is in the golden chain of redemption in Romans chapter 8. Um, on Wednesday night, starting back last fall and then leading up to right before uh, we had to shut down church, uh, we on Wednesday nights were going through the book of Romans, and so we spent a lot of time in depth in that glorious book. But I just want to remind us of what Romans 8, 29 through 30 says. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now we call this the golden chain of redemption because each of these activities by God in securing our salvation link together like a chain. And so those whom God foreknew in eternity past, those whom God set his electing love upon, he predestined to be saved. Those whom he predestined to be saved, at a point in time, he called you through the work of the Holy Spirit. And once the Holy Spirit regenerated you, you repented and believed you were justified. And then you will be glorified one day in heaven. And so the doctrine of justification is the doctrine of how we get saved. Okay, so when you repent and believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are justified. And that means God declares you not guilty, no longer under condemnation on, on account of what Christ has done on the cross. And so all of your sins are credited to Jesus and all of his righteousness is credited to you. So God can make a legal declaration. He can make a verdict as the judge looking down upon your life and saying not guilty because you are in Christ. You've been justified. And that's a permanent position. Paul says in Romans 5, 1 through 2, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we've also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay, so justification asks the question, how am I saved? You are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And when you believe in Jesus, you are justified. Now, one of the blessings of being justified in this passage of Scripture is that you have peace with God. You have a permanent right standing with God. You have access to the very throne of grace. You stand in grace. You are permanently, forever, once and for all, 
acquitted of all sin, you stand not guilty before God in, 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 an, in an eternal, permanent position. And so um, one of the books that I've been reading, since this is on video, um, this is called A Body of Divinity. It's by Thomas Watson. Uh, now, Thomas Watson is one of my favorite Puritans um, of old. And um, A Body of Divinity is basically sermons that he preached on the Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism. This was originally published in 1692. Okay, so back in the 1600s. And so some of the language is a little bit old, but this is a wonderful book that just goes through some basic doctrines of the faith, um, a body of divinity, a very, very rich, a very meaningful time of, of reading this. And, and this is what he says about justification. He says, justification is the very hinge of Christianity. An error about justification is dangerous, like a defect in a foundation. Justification by Christ is a spring of water of life. To have the poison of corrupt doctrine cast into this spring is damnable. So we've got to get justification by faith right. It's the hinge upon which Christianity swings. It's the foundation. And so when you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are once and for all permanently justified, declared not guilty before God on account of the righteousness of Christ being credited to you by faith. So that answers the first question. How do I get saved? Well, you are saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, and, and then you're justified. But the issue that I want to deal with today is the second question. Okay, how do I know I've truly done that? How do I know that I'm saved? Um, I don't know if you've ever doubted your salvation before, or maybe you slipped into a period of backsliding, or you committed a grievous sin, and, and you just you beat your head against the wall wondering, why in the world did I do that? How, how, am I really saved have I really trusted Christ for salvation? Am I really going to go to heaven? Is this all a sham? What's true about me? And it's okay to have those doubts. It's okay to have those feelings of wondering, am I truly secure in Christ? Am I truly saved? And so I want to address the topic of assurance. Now, one of the best places to go for theological statements, concise theological statements, is the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689. That is the confession that stands as the majority of what we believe here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. Our statement of faith is predominantly the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. And in chapter 18 of the confession, they address the assurance of our salvation. And so basically, what they say in that is that we have this assurance that we will forever be in a state of grace and we can rejoice that we have salvation that can never be taken away from us. Now, there have been historically two um, arguments or two pushbacks to the Reformed doctrine of assurance. Okay? How can you truly be sure that you're saved? Okay, So the first camp or the first pushback to this doctrine that we can be sure that we're saved and we can have assurance of salvation basically came back during the time of the Protestant Reformation with the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church says, Protestants, you are crazy to think that you can know that you're saved. Nobody can know that they're saved. And so what they did was they set up the sacramental system, all of the different sacraments that you had to do in order to somehow keep working for your salvation, keep yourself saved, making sure that you don't lose that salvation. So the Roman Catholic Church said, you really can't have assurance of salvation. And so the only way you know you're saved is by doing the sacraments, doing these things that kind of prove out that you're truly saved saved. Okay, the other pushback is what we call, and I'm going to use a big word here, but I'm going to define it. It's important to use 
We need to be um, exposed to theological words that have been used throughout history, but then it's important that we define our terms. This is the term called antinomianism. Now, you're like, what in the world is antinomianism? Anti means against. Anti, against. Nomianism or, it comes from the Greek word nomos, which means the law. So against the law. Now, what does antinomianism really mean? Well, you may have heard it like, talked about as cheap grace or license to sin. It's this whole idea that, hey, I have assurance of salvation. I'm justified by faith. I prayed the prayer. I've got fire insurance. I know I'm going to heaven. Once saved, always saved. Therefore, I can go live however I want. I don't have to worry about holiness. I don't have to worry about going to church. I don't have to worry about reading my Bible or prayer. I've got my free ticket to heaven. Therefore, I can live however I want. I like sinning. God likes forgiving. That's a wonderful relationship. Let's just keep this going. That is not a biblical view of salvation or of assurance of salvation okay so those are the two pushbacks one the roman catholic church says you can't have assurance of salvation you really can't know that unless you do the sacraments the other pushback is um yeah you can have assurance of your salvation but you can live however you want okay so back during the protestant reformation We had the five solas, and we in Emmanuel here, we know the five solas. And one of the solas is sola gratia, or grace alone. Okay, We talk about this all the time here in Emmanuel. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Okay, And we understand that from the scriptures alone. Grace alone, sola gratia, Latin for grace alone. But yet... Even though we're saved by grace alone, there are two graces in the Christian life. So we call this duplex gratia. Okay? When you live in a duplex, what's a duplex? It's two, two uh, little apartments stuck together. So duplex is the Latin word for double, the double grace in the Christian life. And so let me just give you a quote from John Calvin in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is a very, very helpful book on theology, but it explains to us that there are two graces in the Christian life, and this helps us understand how we're saved and then how we continue to live out our salvation. So he said this. He's famous for talking about the double grace. He says, quote, First, being reconciled by the righteousness of Christ, God becomes to us, instead of a judge, a loving father. Okay, that's justification by faith alone. God relates to us as a father by faith alone. We get in, we're justified. But then he says, and secondly, so here's the second grace, being sanctified by the Spirit, we aspire to integrity and purity of life. Okay, so we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone. That's how we get in, justification. But sanctification is the process by which we aspire to holiness through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so all true believers have been justified, the first grace, and all true believers are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, the second grace. So the Christian life is all of grace. You get in by grace, you stay in by grace. Okay, it's not willpower, it's not your effort. Yes, we work out our salvation, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but we need to ha- first have a framework to understand that everything in the Christian life is built on God's grace. Now, you're justified. You're declared forever legally accepted, forgiven, not guilty before God. You know it's a permanent standing. You know you're going to heaven. But... What happens in your heart and in your thoughts and in your mind when you look at your life and you don't see that progress? Or you fall into major sin? Or you have major doubts? So hear me very carefully here. You can never lose your salvation. Okay, that, that's clearly taught in the Bible. That's, that's a topic for a whole other time. But just trust me, the Bible teaches you can never lose your salvation, but you can lose the assurance of your salvation. 
And what I mean by that is you can never lose the, state, the fact that you're saved, but you can go through periods of life wondering if you're truly saved, wondering if you really did repent and believe, wondering if God really does have you in his grip. So what is assurance of salvation? Now, again, I'm going to give a syllogism that comes from the book here by, by Thomas Watts and the Body of Divinity. And, and a syllogism basically just says major premise, minor premise equals a conclusion. It's kind of like a math problem. A plus B equals C. If, if this is true and this is true, then here's the conclusion. And, and everything has to be true all the way through. So here's the major premise. The Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You will be justified. You will be adopted. Okay? This is an objective reality. This is what the Bible teaches. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, so we see that in Romans chapter 10, 9 through 11. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So there is an objective truth that says in the Bible, whoever believes in Jesus will be saved, point blank. That's a truth. That's a promise. If you believe in Jesus, the Bible says, you will be saved. You will be justified. So that's major premise number one. That's true. Okay, minor premise. Okay, minor premise is, okay, I know in my heart that I've done this. I have called upon the name of the Lord. I have trusted in Jesus. Okay? So this is the experiential aspect of it. Okay, the Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, I've done that. I've called upon the name of the Lord. Okay, therefore, conclusion, what's the conclusion? The Holy Spirit works in your heart to let you know not only objectively based upon the scriptures that you're saved, but subjectively in your heart that you are a child of God. Okay, so here's how it works. The Bible says objectively, without dispute, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a promise. Okay, you've done that. If you've called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, if you've repented and believed, you are saved. Okay, so it's a reality. But sometimes you don't feel that. You don't experience that. You don't really trust the fact that you've done that. So the Holy Spirit comes and does a work in your heart to say, listen, remind you, Christian, you did that. You repented and believed. And also the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we're truly children of God. And this is from Romans 8, 15 through 16. For you did not receive the, sp the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit himself, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Okay. So we are adopted into God's family when we repent and believe, when we're justified. That's a bona fide reality. It's objective. But sometimes we don't experience that in our hearts to know that we've done that. And so that's why the Holy Spirit comes and reminds us that we, in fact, did do that. So, 1 John 4, 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit. Okay, so let me just talk about the Trinity here for a moment. Because your assurance of salvation is based upon the work of the triune God in securing your salvation. Okay, remember the golden chain of redemption back in Romans 8 that we started with? Okay, God the Father predestined you, foreknew you, elected you, chose you in eternity past. He set his love upon you in eternity past before the foundation of the world and made sure that you would be saved. Jesus came and died on the cross for your sins, and when you believe in Jesus, the Bible says you're in Christ. You're secure in Christ. You have a permanent standing where you're connected in vital union to Christ. So the Father chose you, and now you're in, in vital union with Christ. And not only that, but the Holy Spirit has come to live inside of you to, to give you that power to live the Christian life and to never leave you. 
And so, this Trinitarian love for you, very, very important, this Trinitarian love, the love that the Father has for you, the love that the Son has for you, the love that the Spirit has for you, all working together in unity, all three persons of the Trinity are working together and have worked to secure your permanent salvation from first to last. So it is a bona fide, objective reality that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Not might be saved or hope to be saved or maybe one day. No, will be saved. Now, Satan is the tempter. And Satan's going to come and tempt you in two ways. Now, the first way he tempts you is he's going to tempt you to sin. That's, a, that's another teaching for another time, how Satan tempts, tempts you to sin, entices you to sin, lures you to sin. But there's a second way that Satan will tempt you. Satan will accuse you, he will shame you, and he will make you doubt God's love for you. That's one of the goals that Satan tries to do, is to try to shame you or accuse you or make you doubt your salvation to wonder if you truly are saved. Now listen to what Revelation 12, 9 through 12 teaches. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of the brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for their love their lives, not even to death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows his time is short. The devil has read the end of the Bible. He knows he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. He knows his time is short, so he's going to try to wreak as much havoc in the meantime upon Christians. And he's called that deceiver Satan. He's called that ancient serpent, the great red dragon. He's the accuser. He's going to come and he's going to accuse you. He's going to make you doubt your salvation. Now, how do we deal with this? How do we struggle with this? So not only does Satan come and make you doubt your salvation, but you have your own thoughts as well, especially when you sin and you fall into major sin patterns, and you're like, am I truly saved? What, what's, what's going on here? Now, um, what are some reasons why we can lose our assurance? Now, remember, we can never lose our salvation, but how, how can you lose your assurance of salvation? How, when do you, what are some causes for going through these periods of doubt? So let me give you three reasons. Number one, when you fall into major sin and grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay, so when you fall into a major sin, and let's be, be real honest here. Let's say, for example, you commit adultery. Or let's say, for example, um, you do something that is pretty much a big sin, and you're a Christian. After periods of doing that, you've grieved the Holy Spirit, you can really begin to doubt your salvation. So number one is, is periods of grievous sin. Okay. Number two, maybe you didn't give in to that grievous sin, but you experienced just this overwhelming temptation that hits you out of the blue, and you didn't give in to the temptation, but you thought, my goodness, I was that close to walking over the edge, and if I walked over the edge, it would be disastrous. And you step back and you think, my goodness, why in the world did I even think about that? If I was truly a Christian, I would have never done that. Thankfully, I didn't jump over the line. So the first one is, I jumped over the line. I can't be a Christian if I did that. The second one is, man, I got that close to the line and didn't jump over. I must not be a Christian for even thinking about that. And then the third thing is, okay, let's say that you're in a long period of backsliding. You're in a long period where maybe you jumped over the line and you're a Christian and you're living in that sin as a pattern. God's going to seem distant. You're not going to feel that intimacy and closeness. And God may actually discipline you. God may, in his fatherly discipline, bring you back to repentance. But during that time, it seems like your affections for God and your salvation just seems like you really don't care because you're in a period of rebellion. So, 
How do you regain your assurance? So let's say that you're in a period right now where you just, you're doubting your salvation. Maybe you are in a period of sin. Maybe you are in a period of despondency where you're just questioning, I don't, I don't really know if I'm saved. Because if I, so maybe Satan's accusing you, you're, you're grieving the Holy Spirit, you've done some things. Okay, so what should you do to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? What should you do to seek the face of the Lord and regain that assurance? Well, the first thing I would tell you to do is to think about the glories of Christ on your behalf. Never, ever look within yourself. Because when you begin to look within yourself, all you're going to see there is your sin, and you're just going to freak out and get despair. It's not going to be a good picture. So always look outside yourself, and always focus first and foremost on the glories of Christ. Who is Christ? What has he done? Who is he to you? Paul says in Philippians 3, 8 through 11, Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul says, listen, there, there's nothing in this world that compares to knowing Christ, treasuring Christ. Everything else he considers rubbish, dung, refuse. Everything else in this world pales in comparison. So the first and foremost thing we've got to do is we've got to turn our eyes back upon Jesus to find in Him all of our satisfaction, all of our glory, all of our meaning and purpose always comes back to focusing in on the glories of Christ. And so if you are doubting your salvation, just look to Jesus. Stop and contemplate who Christ is. What has he done for you? How is he glorious? Do you treasure Jesus? Okay? Now, that's the second. That's the first one. Let me give you the second thing. The second is keep a clear conscience and be quick to confess and repent of sin. Okay, so be quick to confess sin when you fall into it and to repent. Um, Hebrews 10 21 through 23, the writer says, Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, he's talking about Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So God is faithful when we draw near to him in prayer, when we draw near to him in confessing sins, he, he assuages our conscience. He, he will cleanse us. He will forgive us. He will be faithful to wipe away that sin and renew that intimacy with him. So keep short accounts with God. 1 John 1, 8-9, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So first of all, focus on the glories of Christ as your surpassing treasure. Don't look inside yourself, but look outside yourself to Jesus. Number two, be quick to repent. Be quick to confess. And when you do confess and repent, you have the promise that God does hear you. He does cleanse you. He does wash you. He does forgive you. He does cleanse your conscience. Okay, third... Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's just talk about the Holy Spirit for a moment. Because 2 Corinthians 1, 20-22, Paul says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. 
That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, and who has also put a seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Okay, so the Holy Spirit has come and lived inside of us. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's a divine person, not a force or a fog or some type of supernatural it. He is a divine person, the third person of the Trinity, who's come to live inside of us. And therefore, because he is a person, and when I say person, don't think about with body parts, because the Spirit does not have body parts, he's spirit, but he has personality, all the attributes of personality. You can grieve him. You can grieve him. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as for good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So when you sin, you're grieving the Holy Spirit of God. So instead of rushing headlong into sin, grieving the Holy Spirit, instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Am I talking about the sudden ecstatic experience where you begin um, speaking in tongues and doing all of these crazy things? No, that's not what it means to be filled with the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5, 16 through 21, let me explain to you what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 16-21. Making the best use of the time, because the days are evil, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Don't get drunk on wine. Okay, so when you're drunk on wine, what do we say? We say you're under the influence of alcohol. It's influencing you. It's directing you. It's, caught, it's affecting how you make decisions. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is not a one-time issue. The way the verb is used in the original language is to keep on constantly being filled as a lifestyle. So in other words, the Holy Spirit should be guiding you. You should be living under the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life, submitting to the rule of the Holy Spirit in your life. Okay, so what does that look like? What does it look like to be filled with the Spirit? Well, Paul gives us the answer here. If there was anywhere where Paul would say, this is what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit, uh, and all these weird manifestations that you sometimes see uh, on Christian television or, or places like that, he doesn't give that to us because those things aren't biblical. He gives four evidences of what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. In your English Bible here, they're all ending in I-N-G because they're what we call participles that hang off of that main verb, be filled with the Spirit. So keep on constantly being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. What does that look like? Okay, verse 19, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Okay, this talks about corporately gathering for worship, being a person that loves to be around God's people. You are making worship a priority in your life. Number two, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart. This is the personal aspect of your personal and private worship, where you're, you're singing in your heart, you're worshiping the Lord, you're spending time in prayer and Bible study. The first one's more about corporate worship and being around God's people publicly. The second one's about cultivating that relationship with Christ in your heart. And then the third one is giving thanks, always and for everything. Are you a thankful person? Are you a grateful person? Are you bitter? Are you resentful? Um, are you um, always complaining? That's evidence of not being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the fourth one is submitting to one another. Do you have a submissive attitude? Are you putting others in front of yourself? Are you being humble? So being filled with the Spirit means that you're walking in humility, you're walking in love, you're walking in thankfulness, you're cultivating that relationship with Christ in your heart privately, and then you're gathering with God's people corporately to do that. Okay, so 
That's how you regain it. Look to Christ, be quick to confess sin, and seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit or under His influence. Okay, so how do you keep the assurance of your salvation? Remember, you can't lose your salvation, but how do you keep the assurance of your salvation? Okay, let me give you four things here. Four, four practices that you can do to help you stay focused on your security in Christ. And again, when I give you these steps, don't think you can do these in your own power. That's legalism. This comes from the Holy Spirit of God working in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. So first is don't abuse grace. Don't abuse grace. Remember I said earlier one of the pushbacks against assurance is this antinomianism, this idea that you can live however you want? Don't have that attitude. Don't think that just because God loves to forgive, you can continue in sin. Paul addresses this in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? That's the question. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Should I keep on sinning my heart out because God's just going to forgive me? What's Paul's answer? By no means. It's a very strong expression in the Greek text there. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Paul says don't abuse grace. Don't think that just because you can get forgiven and that you are secure in your salvation, that gives you permission to go live however you want. He says, by no means. You died to sin. That's your old life. You're walking in newness of life. So one of the ways to keep that assurance of your salvation is don't abuse grace. Okay, secondly. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to get some water here. Secondly. And this goes back to that first thing I was talking about earlier about Jesus, focusing on Jesus. But secondly, constantly think about the stupendous mercy of God's grace toward you. Think about the stupendous mercy of God. Now, God did not have to choose you. God did not have to save you. God was under no obligation to shower you with mercy. So when you begin to think about the mercy that God has shown you, it floods your heart with joy. It floods your heart with gratitude because you realize how lavish God has been upon you as a rebellious sinner. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 3 through 7, actually let's start in verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Did you count how many times the words are used there? God is rich in mercy, great love with which he loved us. By grace you've been saved immeasurable riches in kindness. Think about the immeasurable riches of kindness that God has shown you in Christ. So number one, don't abuse grace. Don't just think because you're forgiven, you can live however you want. But number two, just constantly think about how much God has showered you with his mercy. And then third, keep your mind and heart set on things above. Keep your mind and heart set on things above. Paul says in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Seek the things that are above. Set your mind on things that are above. Set your heart on things above. In other words, don't get so wrapped up in the things of this world that are sinful, that are worldly, that are going to 
Keep your attention away from Christ. Set your mind on things above. Set your mind on Christ. Saturate your mind in the Scriptures. Keep constantly thinking about the glories of Christ. Think about your salvation. Think about the power of God. Constantly be focusing your mind on things above. And then fourth, walk in humility and avoid pride. Pride is one of the things that will cause you to fall into sin and to stumble. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, 15-17. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost, but I receive mercy for this reason that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul calls himself the chief of sinners. Paul knew what his life was like before God saved him. He was a blasphemer. He was a reviler. He was a persecutor of the church. He was a wicked man. And God saved him, the worst of sinners, to show his perfect patience. And so think about the fact that we should always walk in humility, realizing that If it were not for the grace of God, we too would be the vilest of sinners going headlong into sin and we wouldn't have that grace of salvation if God had not intervened. Thomas Watson again says this, The jewel of assurance is best kept in the cabinet of a humble heart. that's That's very old English way of putting it. The jewel, okay, so think about a jewel. The jewel of assurance... Where's it best kept? Well, you put it in a cabinet. You keep it hidden away. What's the cabinet? A humble heart, walking in humility. So, if you are watching this live stream teaching today, and you, number one, have not trusted Christ for salvation, that's the most important thing you can do is to repent and believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and for eternal life. That's the first question. How do I get saved? But if you already are saved, but you're doubting your salvation and you're wondering if you've sinned beyond God's grasp and you need to have that assurance of salvation regained, hopefully this has been helpful to give you that assurance. Now, what is assurance? Assurance is the rock-solid understanding in your heart and objectively by what the Scripture teaches that you are, in fact, truly saved. Again, when you go through periods of doubt, when you go through periods of sin, we tend to question that assurance. But we need to understand, again, the Trinity. God the Father has chosen you. Jesus Christ the Son has saved you. And the Holy Spirit lives in you. So all three persons of the Trinity have saved you, are keeping you saved, and will ensure that you receive salvation on that final day. And so we can have the assurance deep in our hearts, no matter what's going on in the world, during this COVID-19 pandemic and all of the craziness and all of the uncertainty and all of the fears that sin to surround us. One thing that we can do is we can just step back and say, the one thing I can be assured of is that God loves me. God keeps me. I've been saved. Let me rest in that. Let me walk in humility. Let me be filled with the Spirit. Let me be quick to forget, to, to confess my sins and to repent. Let, let me to avoid pride. Let me, let me treasure Christ. Let me set my mind on things above. All these things come together to give us that joy that peace, that security deep in our hearts. And that's something we desperately need during these times is some security, something to hold on to. And it's ultimately God having you in his powerful grip. Well, thank you, Emmanuel Baptist Church, for watching tonight. Um, I look forward to, quote, unquote, seeing you on Sunday morning. Uh, Just to let you know that tomorrow, Pastor Andrew and I will start our first Ask the Pastors That live stream will be on Thursday evening, and so you need to be paying attention to that. Uh, We've got four questions out of the the shoot that we're going to address on that Ask the Pastors um, live stream that's going to be happening tomorrow, Thursday. So until next time, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus.